I recently read a book by James Fenimore Cooper, who is most well known for The Last of the Mohicans, which many of you have probably heard of. Uh, but this was a book of his that was not a novel. It's called The American Democrat. And this book has a number of thoughts on the United States. Cooper wrote this while he was traveling overseas to Europe quite a bit and coming back to the United States. Uh, his family founded Cooperstown, New York. Uh, and he wrote a lot of his thoughts on the things that America does well and then some of the, the problems that we have as a nation, things that we can improve on. And he's got some really, I think, very valuable points. So I want to talk about one particular idea that is used all throughout the text of this this particular book, and that is the role of the gentleman in society. Now, Cooper talks about different forms of society. You have, you know, an aristocracy, you have a strict monarchy, and then you have a democracy. And he's, of course, talking about America in terms of, of the, a democracy, but he speaks about some positive things about each of those forms of government and some negative things about each of those forms of government. Ultimately, he's a supporter of democracy, but he's also trying to get us to recognize what are some of the, the shortcomings or things that we can improve upon because of the lack of any nobility. And he talks about the nature of of culture, the nature particularly of high culture. And when I, when I mean high culture, I'm talking about you know, beauty, the, the beautiful things in life. The, the, what he talks about is the elevated things. So the beautiful art, beautiful architecture, beautiful uh, music, those things that have been passed on through Western culture and have, have been, you know, not classical novels you may think of. Uh, things that, that have been passed on for generations in Western culture and preserve timeless truths. They are things that are valuable for more than just entertainment purposes, which is why they've persisted and lasted through through generations. And Cooper notes that in a you know in a, a system where you have a strict monarchy, the nobility really defines what that high culture is going to be. The nobility has a role to kind of preserve the best things in life. And there are some reasons why the nobility does that. One is because the nobility has money. So, right, if you have, you know, some of the best musicians in, in the history of the world are court musicians. Uh, they have been paid by the nobility because the nobility has the money to fund it. So the nobility funds the arts, right? They, they support the arts through uh, their own interest in them, and uh, they have financial backing. One, one thing that that also means, though, if the nobility is funding the arts, that means that there are some significant limits on the arts, right? Because you have to, you know, if you're being paid to make something by somebody, you got to kind of make them happy so you can't offend them too much. You see this with, for example, a lot of operas that were commissioned uh, at times where a character that was nobility had to be kind of changed to something else because it was too critical of the nobility and they didn't like the optics of it. So, uh, but but it does put some set some significant limits on the art or music that is going to be uh, created because you've got somebody that's paying for it and they're not going to pay for it if they don't like it. So, which I guess in a democracy works too, in a, kind of a, a different way in our in our system. But um, or you have the aristocrats. If you have an aristocratic society, you have an entire class of individuals who are devoted to to the finer things, right? The aristocrats, and they have time. They have time, and this is the other part of this, there's money, but there's also time. So you have time for leisure. And it's only when you have time for leisure that you have time to, you know, enjoy novels or, you know, delve deeply into music or in, enjoy, you know, learn manners, the, the kinds of things that are often associated with this, you know, elevated class. And, and that is the language that Cooper uses here. So that's why I'm using a language elevated here. And Cooper notes that there is an, an importance in that class in society that is missing within a democracy. And he's plenty critical of what goes on in a strict monarchy and an aristocracy as well in, in those ways, because he says, you know, the aristocracy basically says you get you get to be kind of the the class that preserves culture, you get to be the class that enjoys the finer things just because of your birth. Uh, and the beauty of democracy is that that is broadened, right? That is broadened beyond just a particular family 
or you know, be just having to have been born in a particular um, you know social structure in one way or another. And and Cooper says, in a democracy, the benefit is that you can have those those beauties, those finer things, but you don't have to have been born in this or that or that class. Things just kind of naturally take their course. So he what what he argues for, and he doesn't call this an aristocracy. What he calls for is a specific class to guide society that he calls a class of gentlemen. And he, he's not uh, disincluding women from this either because he talks about ladies having this role as well. Uh, but and he says ladies naturally have refinement, men don't. <laughs> so 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 like we, you know, he says women are essentially are essential to society in that way. But they're not na- they're naturally, you know, they they move toward refinement in a way that men don't. So they help to refine society, and they're an essential part of that. But we need to have male leaders, men who are going to be that gentlemanly class within the United States to preserve the goodness of the culture that we have inherited. And and those those finer things in in culture, and he recognizes that in America this is just really not happening. And so, in an evaluation of, and he goes through all sorts of things here, but he talks about music and he talks about manners, and he speaks about how in the United States, though, though we have, in some ways, el- we've certainly elevated kind of the lowest classes, so you don't have this same kind of peasantry that you have perhaps in some other cultures that are like totally cut off from you know the benefits of of society he says the great thing about an american society is there is opportunity for for all we don't have that kind of cut off peasant class so we we tend to elevate the lowest however he says the the other danger in that and this is the danger of democracy in 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 general not just the united states is that it tends to kind of bring the upper down. It kind of equalizes people, but it does it in a way often that those things which are really, you know, higher tastes, which he says are essential for preserving culture because they are the cultural artifacts, those the, those tastes tend to kind of go down toward others as well. So while we elevate the low, we also bring down the high in terms of of, of music and, and the arts and manners and these other things. And here's a here's a statement which I think is very helpful to to illustrate this. He says, as nothing is more self-evident than the impossibility of raising all men to the highest standard of taste and refinement, the alternative would be to reduce the entire community to the lowest. So he's recognizing, look, not everyone is going to have the highest tastes in society. Not everybody is going to, you know, devote themselves to to understanding you know, all of the particulars of manners or to, to learning about, you know, Renaissance art and, and spend their time at museums or going to operas or, or reading classic literature. Of course, not everybody's going to do that. And not everybody in a society has to do that, right? Because he's not saying that that's everyone's role. He's not saying that the people who do this are better than the people who don't. But he's saying this is an element of civilization that somebody needs to preserve. And so if there's nobody doing it, it's not going to be preserved at all because of course, not all people are going to, to do that because not all people have the temperament or desire to do that, and that's fine. But uh, it's a lot easier to take those people who would be preserving those things and just kind of bring them down to the lowest level. And that's how you you lose the most beautiful artifacts in culture. So those things need to be retained. And so he says, we need to really self-consciously have this class of gentlemen who are those who are really trained to really to preserve high culture. And that that is an essential element of, he says, any society. But we're missing, we miss that in its, because we don't have an aristocracy or a nobility, we miss it as being something that is kind of forced on us, right? Now we have people that have to actually freely choose to do that. And the problem is when we don't have people that are freely choosing to do that, it goes away. So he's trying to get us to freely choose to do that. The the other problem that he cites in the United States is just the newness of our institutions. So he says culture is largely preserved, say in Europe, you know, look at look at Oxford and Cambridge in, in England. You have these very ancient institutions, and because they're so old, they're they're more difficult to change. This is something that's true about older institutions. This can be for good or for ill. Right? And on the one hand, an old institution 
can persist in error much longer because it's harder to change, but it can also preserve goodness much longer. Newer institutions are by nature much, much easier to change and to change quickly. And the United States doesn't have a lot of historic institutions in the way that Europe does. Now, as we're looking today, you know, he wrote 200 years ago, almost. So we do have institutions that are much older than they were at, at his time, but he's already seeing in these brand new institutions a desire for novelty and constant change. And he's making an argument that as Americans, we have to try to actually preserve institutions and, and have those institutions that have connection just beyond the, the present moment. So maybe I should just define what exactly is a gentleman in, in what Cooper is saying, because he has a, a definition here. And this is on page 119. I, I read the ebook edition on Nook, so the page numbers are probably different if you read it in print. I don't know. Uh, but he says, the word gentleman is derived from the French, gentil homme, which I'm totally pronouncing wrong, but sorry, because uh, that was not did not sound French, which originally signified one of noble birth. As society advanced, ordinary men attained the qualification of nobility without that of birth in the meaning of the word was extended. So, so he's seeing this as something that that is a positive movement in society, that we have moved away from this understanding of, of beauty and manners and the arts that is just this one particular class that other people are cut off from to say, now we, we have opened this up so that this is something that we can freely choose to be this. We can freely choose to to become gentlemen, to to learn these things and to learn refinement. But here's a, a, a really important point that Cooper brings up here, is in an American society, and he says, the fact is we're going to have social inequality no matter what. Okay, this is just the nature of how people are. If you get any group of people together, they are not, they are not equal because we are not the same. And by not equal, I don't mean not equal before God or not as valuable or not as good or anything like that. I'm saying that we are not equal in our skills or abilities or personalities or interests or any of those things because we're just different. So people have different athletic abilities or intellectual abilities. We're not equal in the absolute sense. We, we can't be. Cooper cites, he says, I don't think there are two people on the earth that you could bring together and say they're equal in every way. We're just not. We're made differently. So because, because that's the case, a functional, totally egalitarian society is just an impossibility. You get a group of kids together that have no training in you know, the structures of society and have them play a game. One is going to take a role of leader and the other is going to take other roles. And if they don't do that, they're not going to be able to play a game. It's how just humans function. So even if you don't have formal divisions in a society, you're going to have divisions. You're going to have hierarchies. They are created naturally. It's impossible to function without them because there's just no order, then there's chaos and nobody has their role, nobody knows what they're doing. So he's saying, recognize this, like don't ignore it. And Americans tend to want to just ignore that reality. Just recognize that reality. You're not gonna do yourself any good by just ignoring that there are distinctions in, in social rank. There are distinctions in social rank. Um, but then you have the question of, well, how do you determine what's valued socially? And he's already seeing this in his time, and this is prior to the, you know, the Gilded Age. But he's already seeing, and, he's, and I think there's a lot of his work is very prophetic here, but he's seeing that basically the merchants, those who are involved in economics, those who are making money, end up becoming the more important. So that society is going to then hold on a pedestal or look to as kind of role models what we want to be those who make the most money. So then money replaces taste. And... Cooper recognizes that taste and money are totally different. You know, he, he makes the point that you could be a gentleman and makes, make less money than your servant, at one point he says. Because being a gentleman, understanding taste, it's not about finance. It's not about financial class. And that's the beauty of our system is you can, look, you can go on YouTube and you can look up the, the greatest you know, opera productions that have ever been filmed. You can, you can find the best literature that you can download on your Kindle for 99 cents. It, money at this point is not really much of a barrier at all to, to finding the best of our culture. So, so money's not the barrier. You can learn taste, but it actually takes time and work which is hard to do. And it also means a lot of self-restraint, 
which is really hard to do. Uh, and that's the opposite of what is often the American mindset. So Cooper recognizes that if we don't do that and we don't emphasize that and we don't uh, try to bring our young men up to become these gentlemen, what they're going to do is look toward because men are always looking for better social standing. Like that's that's the reality. You can deny it and you can say it's bad and the patriarchy or whatever, but it's the reality. What are they going to do? They're going to strive for more money and more power because they want higher social standing. And how do you do that? Money. So what we've done is we've really idolized money and we have replaced taste with money. Uh, and unfortunately, that means that that's what guys are striving after. They don't want to be you know, the most gentlemanly. They don't want to be the one who's the most cultured. They want to be the one who makes the big bucks. And they want to be the one who can afford the really expensive car. And this essentially is, is a society without a soul, which is the point that, that Cooper makes, is you're you're striving for a society that is just purely economic and you're missing the heart and morality and soul and culture of a people. And it's all just replaced with monetary gain. So with all of that being said, why am I talking about this? Because I think being a gentleman is an absolute necessity for our culture. And as we are battling so many issues in our culture now, we, we have so much cultural chaos we can jump into the Andrew Tate mindset of we need to fight against radical feminism by getting lots of women and lots of cars and idolizing our wealth and showing it off to everybody and bragging about ourselves. And that's where a lot of young men are going. And I get it. I totally get it. But it's not healthy for them. <laughs> What's the other option? And I'm saying that there is another option which is to say that we recapture this classical idea of being a gentleman and and preserve the things of our culture and pass them on to our kids and have families and and get involved in institutions and bring others to get to know the classics of our culture because culture is going to be preserved through the things that have always preserved our culture and that is our arts and our literature and our music uh, and and that's how our, our faith is often passed on. You know, it's often said that hymns are the sermons that you remember. <laughs> uh, you know, you forget what the pastor says on Sunday, maybe. But if you sing that hymn regularly, you know those words. That's how ideas, that's how culture, that's how faith is, is passed on. So we need to make sure that we are preserving those things. And, and that's how, in my mind, that's how we save Western culture. So I would love to see more people, more men looking toward this idea of, of a gentleman as, as a way to, to live and to preserve our culture. Um, so thanks so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe and we'll see you in the next one. God bless.